Uh, our next speaker is Daniel Fix. Uh, I will ask a question to Daniel, but first I will introduce him. He's the chief of the Biological Weapons Convention Implementation Support Unit. He's in charge of assisting Biological Weapons Convention states parties in their efforts to implementation of the global, this global treaty, as well as assisting remaining countries in acceding to the Biological Weapons Convention. My friend Daniel uh, used to work uh, at the, uh, had the senior positions at the Organization for the Prohibition of uh, Chemical Weapons. We worked there together, and he has um, a strong interest in science and technology and how its developments are going to affect global disarmament and non-proliferation treaties. Now, Daniel, tell us what's going to happen if AI succeeds and what's going to happen with the Biological Weapons Convention or with Biological Weapons. Thanks very much, Irakli. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, to Unicri, to Georgia for organizing this event. I think it's been a very interesting discussion so far. I've certainly learned a lot already this afternoon. I'm sure there'll be more things to learn as we go on towards the end of this event as well. And I think it just shows a lot about the multifaceted nature of this, you know, of this issue of CBRN <coughs> and the, the science and the technology that underpins it. What I'm going to talk about, I'm not really going to focus on the details. I'm not myself a um, scientist. I'm not someone who's a technical person here. I'm going to talk more about the governance framework and the way that we think about managing these technologies and particularly focusing on, as Iraqi said, the Biological Weapons Convention and the way in which that is used um, to, to govern and to manage um, biology, basically. Um, first of all, I want to start with... Um, Looking, I mean, we're meant to be here looking at the future, but I also want to look back to the past, and it's quite, quite good that both previous presenters have also referred back to historical um, you know, examples and things like that as well. So I want to go kind of, like it says here, back to the future. I also um, just like to note that this month is the month in the film Back to the Future that Marty McFly, when he was time-traveling in 1985, it was October 2015, that he time traveled forward to. Oh, look, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> With his hoverboard. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, that was 30 years. He went from 85 to 2015. I want to go back to another 10 years, so to 1975. Um, two events happened in that year, 1975, that were probably at the time not connected, not thought of as being related to each other at all. The first of them was a conference in a place in California, or a conference center in California called Azilama. Um, it brought together scientists, and basically what they did, they drew up voluntary guidelines to ensure the safety of recombinant DNA technology. This was, they were already thinking, you know, this field was, there were these new developments, these new advances that were happening, which could pose risks, that could pose challenges. So a group of mainly scientists, some journalists, some others were involved as well, but mainly scientists, you can see some of them there in the photos, um, came together, and it's widely seen you know, looking back now as a kind of a landmark in the self-governance of science. It's, there are kind of, you know, differences in the kind of the impact of value that people put on this particular conference. But it was, as I said, it was, it's widely seen and it's widely referred to now. People often speak about other areas of um, technological advances needing their kind of a, Zil a Zilomar moment. As I said, something else happened that year, very soon after, in fact. Zilomar was February, then this is uh, March 1975. You see pictures here from where I work in Geneva. This is inside the UN um, building, the Palais des Nations in Geneva, where the Biological Weapons Convention, the BWC, um, it was negotiated a few years before then. These are pictures. It was very much a kind of a product of the Cold War. You can see USA, USSR there. They were the co-chairs of the Conference on Disarmament at the time, the negotiating body in which the treaty was negotiated. Another picture here from the same time. I mean, the people in these pictures are slightly smarter than the scientists you saw, but you can still kind of, you know, tell it's roughly around about the same time, sometime during the 70s. Um, so this treaty, it was the first international agreement to effectively ban an entire category of weapons of mass destruction. Later on, you had, as Dieter was talking about, the Chemical Weapons Convention, but the BWC was the first one to do this. It's a short, simple, but elegant treaty which it's faced challenges over its 40 years, but it today represents a strong norm against the hostile use of biology, and it has a membership of 173 states from around the world, many of which are represented by the people in this room. 
The convention itself, you can see uh, that this is the front page of the kind of the official version with the seal on it of the convention and a couple of quotes from the preamble, so like the opening kind of objectives of the convention. Um, it's comprehensive. It kind of comprehensively prohibits biological warfare. And you can see from the second quote there that it refers to this, this kind of repugnance, this, this abhorrence of using biology, of using disease as a weapon. And this is a taboo that you can kind of see stretching back to ancient history. You can look at ancient documents from various cultures around the world and you can see that in, you know, across the world for centuries, the idea of using poison, of using disease as a weapon has been something that's really almost psychologically, you know, kind of bred into us as humans. It's kind of in our DNA almost that this is something that is really quite kind of, as it says there, repugnant to the conscience of mankind. Um, just in terms of what the BWC actually covers, and you might not be able to, and you don't necessarily need to read everything on there, but its scope is also comprehensive as well. It covers the use of biological agents, not just against humans, but also against animals and plants. And as you can see, hopefully on the screen there, this is something from the, a conference that took place on the Biological Weapons Convention in 2011. It applies to all naturally or artificially created or altered microbial and other biological agents and toxins. And the conference that took place back then, as you can see in the second paragraph, reaffirmed that it applies to all scientific and technological developments in the life sciences and other relevant fields. So it's, as I said, its scope is comprehensive, its prohibitions are also comprehensive as well. Before moving on, I just wanted to kind of flag some of these um, risks, and we've seen some of these listed already. Um, you know, we're talking about things like the diseases, the outbreaks that we're familiar with just in the recent months, basically. The MERS outbreak in South Korea, it was a small outbreak, but it caused a big economic impact. Ebola in West Africa, obviously, at least 11,000 deaths. Big economic impact again there in the, in the afflicted countries. Um, recent modeling by the World Bank says that a Spanish flu, this is the kind of flu that, that the epidemic that happened or pandemic after the First World War, could kill more than 33 million people in 250 days and cost almost 5% of global GDP. And then the World Economic Forum in its Global Risks Report this year, um, two of the risks are kind of related to what we're talking about here. One of them they identified as rapid and massive spread of infectious diseases. Another one was weapons of mass destruction. When we're talking about biological weapons, we're kind of linking, linking those two, two identified risks together. What I wanted to do now, just kind of flagging these risks, I want to turn and talk a bit, like I said, I'm going to talk about the, the Biological Weapons Convention itself and the kind of the governance framework and the way in which the practical implementation of the BWC takes place. And, you know, the hope is here that what I'm saying is of relevance and of some kind of interest perhaps to, you know, how we think about managing the risks that are posed by, you know, artificial intelligence, for example, and some of these other technological developments that we're thinking about. Um, this guy was a, um, as you can see, a former US ambassador to the Biological Weapons Convention. And what I wanted to put this quote here for is, it basically reminds us that as much attention should be paid to kind of implementing these treaties as is paid to their negotiation. We have a lot of attention if you think, you know, we need to get a new treaty in force, we need to, you know, we have a campaign to get countries to join or to get them to adopt a treaty. After that, people generally forget about it, and it, it's left to kind of be implemented at a much lower level with much less attention. What he's saying here is that these treaties need to be tended. They need to be nurtured over their lifetimes. And basically that there's a lot of kind of invisible work, really, that's done in the background by officials. He talks about that some officials will have to live with these treaties full time, all the time. From our point of view, the most visible way in which this happens is the meetings that we host in Geneva. Every year we have two meetings, a more technical one, generally in the summertime. You can see a picture there from one of our recent ones. And it's got a more political one which takes place in the winter, generally around about December. You can see the dates for this year's meetings. But these meetings are really only a part of the story. This is what you see, like I said, it's the more visible thing. As much activity goes on at the national level and which is where the work that happens in the BWC context really closely overlaps with what we were hearing earlier about what UNICRI is doing, what the states are doing with the national action plans. 
and what the European Union is supporting in that respect as well, and the centres of excellence. So I, I just wanted to hear, acknowledge um, that work and say, you know, how important that also is um, and the work that the states are doing themselves for implementing, you know, in, in our terms, the Biological Weapons Convention. This slide is just a, a kind of overview of what agenda items are being discussed and what particular topics are being discussed in the, the program of work that has been running with the Biological Weapons Convention since 2012. I won't go through all of them at, at all, but I, what, the one I really wanted to focus on is the one in the kind of middle um, oval at the bottom there. It says reviewing S&T, reviewing science and technology. And that's really what I wanted to be kind of focusing most of the rest of this on. You can see, and again, I don't expect you all to read, and I certainly won't read through this whole list, but these are the topics which the, the member states of the BWC back in 2011, the last time they reviewed the whole treaty, these are the science and technology topics that they identified as being the ones that they would study for the next five years, so from 2012 up until um, this year. Um, you can see, hopefully, from the top two there, A and B, that, and we've already heard it from the previous two presenters, it's important to look at both risks and benefits to these things. So you can see there they talk about things having potential for uses contrary to the BWC, but also that have potential benefits for the Convention as well. So as with these other technologies we were hearing about, there are both involved here. And then also there's elements there about codes of conduct and things that promote a kind of a responsible um, culture or a culture of responsible science. One particular advance, and I mean there are many that are discussed in these meetings and there are many that are relevant to the BWC, but one that's been much in the news recently, as you can see from this front page of The Economist from a couple of months ago, is something called CRISPR-Cas, which is, it's been discussed at our meetings in Geneva. It's basically something that can be used for, for editing genes, basically adding, disrupting, or changing the sequence of specific genes. And as you kind of get the impression from this picture, it's something that people say you could actually be using to kind of basically create designer babies is obviously what they're getting at here, to edit humanity, as it says. It's obviously something that can bring great benefits to humanity, you know, curing diseases or preventing diseases being carried through generations. But as I said, with lots of these advances, it obviously brings risks with that as well, whether by accident or by intent. Besides the annual meetings that I referred to that we have in Geneva, these two meetings every year, and I've, I've mentioned a couple of times that the member states of the BWC actually meet every five years to kind of have a comprehensive review of the, um, the operation of the treaty itself. Last time was in 2011, the next one is coming up next November. And you can see from this extract from the treaty itself, and the, the bottom there, says that the review shall take into account any new scientific and technological developments relevant to the convention. So that was kind of baked into the convention from its beginnings that science and technology would need to be reviewed and would be an important part of that review every, um, every five years. And based on the discussions, as I said, each year, I showed you the list of topics earlier that have been discussed over the last five years. And the review that will be coming up next year, this is what the last review conference, the one that took place in 2011, said should happen in 2016, that they should also again look at new developments. So since 2011, developments that have taken place since then should be reviewed and assessed in 2016. Um, before finishing, I've got a couple more slides, and one of the things I wanted to kind of put up here on the screen, it's a quote I use sometimes in presentations, and I think it really kind of gets to the core. Some people think there's a kind of silver bullet here when we're talking about these kinds of technologies, that you can solve the problem. You know, you can ban something, or you can just, you know, stop people doing certain things. And as Joshua Lederberg says here, he, he was someone who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1958. He did a lot, I mean, a very, very eminent, very, you know, um, very well-known, very well-respected molecular biologist, also did some work on artificial intelligence, apparently, as well. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of this until I was reading about him more recently. You know, he made this point that there is no technical solution to this problem. It's something that's, it needs to be managed, it needs to be governed, and it's not enough just to look at the technical side. You also need to look at the ethical, the human, and the moral dimensions of this problem as well. What I wanted to finish on, as I said, I'm not going to get into the kind of the, the technical issues, but just a few key points. And the first one of those is exactly what I just said from Joshua Lederberg, is that it's, you know, 
with lots of these technologies, it's about managing them, it's about oversight, it's about governance, it's not a quick fix solution, you, ca you can't solve the problem. We've seen with the BWC that it's also very important to engage and to involve a diverse range of stakeholders, so not just governments, not just industry, but scientists, academics, um, civil society more generally. Third thing is this whole issue of you know, talking about science in, in the diplomatic context, which is basically what happens in Geneva. It's really a diplomatic setting, but then you're talking about hard, you know, kind of very cutting edge science issues sometimes. That's difficult, and that's not just something that applies to the, to the BWC. We look at climate change, we look at lots of these other issues that are big global issues, but explaining those to, well, to the general public, but also to decision makers and to politicians is a very difficult task, and we really haven't worked out how to, what's the best way of doing that. And then the final thing is that it's very important to focus, as, as we've heard, on the benefits. It's very easy and we get lots of hype and, you know, you talk about sci-fi and Hollywood films and, you know, these kind of doomsday scenarios about the, the risks and, you know, what could happen. But it's very important to focus on the benefits. You know, you mentioned already how most people go into these, into these subjects, into these fields for good reasons. And, you know, that's, that's important. And it's also important to make sure that the benefits that come from these advances are shared amongst all countries rather than you know, as is sometimes the case, or at least the perception that these new advances are things that are only, um, you know, kept and only available for, for certain countries of the world. Um, so those were the things that I wanted to kind of leave you with. Those are the um, contact details of, of me and my unit. Um, what I wanted to leave the final, final word was not me, but hopefully if the video will work properly, I wanted to leave the final word with the UN Messenger of Peace, who's um, Michael Douglas when it comes to disarmament affairs. And we had a short video message which was um, prepared earlier this year for us. And it, it's very short, it's about 90 seconds or so. But he, much more eloquent than me, he says, you know, he summarizes the issue and sums up the, the kind of key point. So I'll hand over to Michael Douglas if it works. We are all aware of the terrible devastation and economic impact which naturally occurring diseases can cause. Naturally occurring diseases are a threat which humanity has been facing for many thousands of years. And in some cases, we have been fortunate to overcome them. For example, the successful eradication of smallpox. Imagine then the deliberate use of disease as a weapon of war or terror. In the early 1970s, the international community therefore negotiated a treaty to outlaw biological weapons. The Biological Weapons Convention came into effect in 1975 and now has over 170 member states. This treaty outlaws biological weapons and is a vital part of the world's efforts against the spread of weapons of mass destruction. With its 40th anniversary year now here, I call on all those working in the biological sciences to promote a culture of responsible, safe, and secure science on the remaining states to join the Biological Weapons Convention as soon as possible, and on the current states' parties to continue to improve its implementation. In this way, we can ensure that the use of biological weapons remains, as the treaty states, repugnant to the conscience of mankind.